<laughs> hey everybody, JD here again and uh, pushing the wrong buttons like usual. So <laughs> welcome to another episode of Fish with JD TV. Uh, pretty pumped tonight. We have the hatchery versus wild coexist guys on. Um, Dave Champ and Polly Jack Smith. He's still trying to get on, so we will uh, we will keep you updated on that. It's uh, it's always uh, you know just it's always a mess here, but that's that's all right. It's fun. So uh, anyway, um, one of the things I was uh, thinking about this week, and we're going to get to this hatchery salmon steelhead versus wild thing, and can they coexist here in just a sec? But um, thinking about salmon got me thinking about. Uh, going to Alaska and typically this will be the first year I haven't gone to Alaska for Kings uh, to guide up on the Togiak or the Nushigak in, in quite some time. So in honor of that, I started watching some of my um, my YouTube videos. And one of the things that I like to do when I'm in Alaska, besides fish, obviously, is um, go crazy jet boating. So here's here's a little uh, little fun thing from a couple years ago up there just to uh Buy some time till Jack gets on. Uh, <laughs> little beaver guy. Uh, yeah. So that's um, that's just a little sample of the uh, the fun stuff that uh, we do up there in Togiak. Um, speaking of that, I guess uh, I just heard that uh, September 10th through the 15th is still open to fish with me for coho up there. And as you guys have probably watched, uh, I guess it was last week, the week before I did the the uh, the top water coho video. Um, it's pretty awesome. So anyway, if you uh, have any interest in going to Alaska this fall and fishing with me, uh, just send me a message and we'll get you in touch with the right people. Um, also, we have a, what is today? The 10th of June. So we still have a couple days left in the Douglas Rod Giveaway Contest. And uh, you get to uh, win a chance to win a Douglas LRS rod of your choice. And also a consultation with me and Big Fred Kintawi, the rod designer on uh, what might be the best rod for you. And the way you go about that is go over to, um, what is my website again? Fishwithjdcontest.com. That's right. Uh, go over to that. And all you got to do is put your name and email address in there and you are registered to win that uh, LRS rod. And we're going to bring the winner on if they so choose uh, onto the show and uh, with a consultation with me and Fred. And uh, we'll uh, we'll figure out which rod you should get for free, which is always cool. So uh, anyway, and then uh, what else we got? Oh, it's uh, it's also... So the tip of the week this week is check out my new steelhead course. Just came out. It's been a labor of love for ugh, at least two years of, you know, on and off work and putting this thing together. And it's designed for the beginner steelheader to what we call the frustrated amateur uh, intermediate type uh, steelheader. And this in this class, I've put together six hours of 
on the water instruction, all kinds of lectures, diagrams. I mean, everything you need to know. When I was putting it together, my thought was, what would I have wanted when I was struggling as a beginning steelheader? And uh, tried to cover all the basics that uh, you need to kind of get started and get out there and actually start catching some fish. So if I can make this work, I'll show you a little insight, just kind of what, what it looks like. Let's see if we can make this happen. There we go. So if you were in the course, you have all this stuff here, um, introductions. Oh, wait, I'm not even at the top. So you got all these lessons here. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And a lot of them are videos. Uh, let's just take a take a look at one here. Uh, how to side planer techniques. Let's let's check that out. So, okay, go. And it's all just how to stuff. With a catchy okay, little intro. Side planer rigged up. Again, remember that the fin goes on the opposite side of the planer. We've got the current going this way. So this is the this little pointy end. That's the bow or the nose of the side planer. So that's always facing upstream. The side planer outrigger deal is going to be on the opposite side of you. That's what takes the planer away from you. Okay. You on this side you okay. And so way. let's take a look at another one here real quick. Low water. Oh, this is a lecture. Well, it had to happen, right? The perfect green steely conditions gave way as the rain stopped to low, clear, skinny flows. Oh no, a lot of guys really fear this and rightfully so. Steelhead fishing can be very difficult in these conditions, especially when there's some traffic on the water. The steelhead, first of all, can see you from a hundred miles away in this. And let's just click a one more real quick here. Oh, uh, that's another lecture. Let's look at a video. Let's look at a video here. Uh, float fishing. Gearing up for float fishing. Here we go. So this is kind of stuff, just, just everything you need to know. Hey folks, JD here again, and today we're going to talk to you about basic bobber fishing for steelhead. Now this is a great concept for you beginners who are just kind of getting into the sport. Great for the bank angler. It's good for advanced fishermen too, I do it a lot. But if you're just kind of new to this whole thing, this is a great way to get into your first steelhead. Now... One is, since your gear is suspended up off the bottom, you're not going to get as many snags. Fewer snags, fewer headaches, more time fishing, spend less money buying stuff. So that's really a good benefit. You also can reach a bunch of water that you wouldn't be able to reach other. All right. So there you go. Whoops, my camera fell. <laughs> oh, it's always something. All right. Hang on. Hang on. Let's, let's go to a different camera. Here we go. All right, that should be working. <laughs> uh, low res camera, my other camera fell down. So there you have it. It's always uh, just a, an adventure here. So that's the class. Um, uh, it's available at uh, catchmoresteelhead.com. Check it out if you're, oh, there it is. If you're uh, one of those uh, frustrated uh, intermediates or beginners, it kind of just gets you on the right path to catching steelhead without all the headaches and the frustrations of having to learn it on yourself or go on YouTube and trying to figure stuff out. So anyway, that's that. Uh, looks like we don't have Jack yet on, but uh, we're going to jump into this and we'll see if we can't uh, can't make it work somehow. Uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully uh, Dave has uh, heard something from him, but we'll get Dave in here from... There he is. There he is. Can you hear me, Dave? <laughs> I can. All right. All okay. Right. We were hey, JD. Couple, how you doing? Thanks for coming on. And um, any any word from Jack? Yeah, I just uh, I got a, just got a phone call from Jack, and uh, so Jack lives out in the middle of nowhere. He actually yeah. lives about ten miles east of Tillamook, right on the banks of the Wilson River. Sounds and terrible. So he relies on Wi-Fi for his internet connection. And no apparently your program doesn't like his Wi-Fi. Ah, okay. So you're stuck with me. Well, uh, there's, there's worse fates to have. So, uh, Dave, what is your uh, what is your official title with uh, the organization uh, at True Wild Coexist? Or do you have so, one? Well, I, to the degree I have one, it is I'm one of four directors okay. of the Hatchery and Wild Coexist campaign. Okay, so okay. one of four directors. And now, was Dave Ng kind of in on the ground floor all this? Was he sort of one of the 
original chiefs on this deal? Dave was, has been, continues to be involved uh, from the very onset. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this whole hatchery wild, hatchery versus wild thing started almost six years ago now. The Association of Northwest Steelheaders produced an excellent video uh -huh. um, introducing this topic, introducing this subject. And Dave Ng uh, was involved with that effort. So when we relaunched this campaign, uh, Dave, of course, was right there, ready and willing to offer all the help and support that he can and uh, continues to be very supportive of the campaign. Awesome. awesome. Well, let's get into it. And, and for folks, uh, let me get the website up here if they want to check out more. Uh, here, there it is. Uh, uh, hatchery wild coexistcom It's a little bit of a mouthful, but um, uh, go ahead and check that out. And, and, and you guys are on uh, Facebook and Instagram and all that too as well. Yes, we are. And, um, so I was uh, taking a look at the website and let me just read sort of the mission statement for everybody here just to kind of get an idea what this is all about. So Hatchery and Wild Code this is a campaign highlighting the importance of fish hatcheries and the role they play in wild fish recovery and providing abundant fisheries. For decades, hatcheries have provided important mitigation for loss of naturally spawned salmon and steelhead while providing fishing opportunities. Uh, uh, <laughs> they have helped ensure the ongoing existence of many salmon and steelhead runs and the fisheries they provide. So, um, thumbs up to that. I'm in. Um, and one of the, the, the great misconceptions, well, let's, let's not even go there. Let's just say one of the things you hear a lot are hatchery fish are inferior. And, um, and they also are a fish that um, supposedly causes great decline in the wild fish population. But I think, and I, and I believe you guys are on the same page here, the, we're overlooking the, the problems. Why wild fish? It's not that there's hatchery fish in the system, right? It's, we're looking at dams and habitat loss and overharvest and pollution and blah, 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 killer whales, I mean, whatever it is. Right. And, and so it seems like we're glazing over the actual issue here by just saying hatcheries are bad. Right. For whatever reason, and, and we don't actually know for sure why, but uh, the wild fish advocates have decided to scapegoat hatcheries as being the cause in some cases or being identified as a major cause in the decline of wild fish. And uh, we know that's simply not true. Um, Hatchery practices, hatcheries have been around since the 1870s. First hatchery was built in Oregon in 1877. First hatchery was built in Washington in 1895. JD, I'll rely on you to let me know when the first hatchery was built in California. But back in those days, they looked at hatcheries in the same way that they looked at growing crops of wheat or raising cattle. They had no idea of the science, no idea of the life cycle of salmon. They thought that you put fry in the river and the next year you were getting those fish back. They mm. didn't realize that those fish were three, four, five, six years old when they came back. Um, we've learned a lot since 1877 and hatchery practices today can actually help improve our wild fish abundance. So we weren't doing it right for a long time, but we know how to do it right now. And one of the things that this campaign advocates for is improved hatchery practices, improved hatchery management. We don't we need to do away with out of basin stocking. Um, we need to do away with um, the programs where they're just taking hatchery fish after hatchery fish after hatchery fish, putting them back in the system. Uh, Brood stock programs work. The evidence is uh, out there. There's a lot of evidence that shows utilizing wild fish as brood stock. Uh, produces uh, a very good fish mm -hmm. and 
there are many examples of where those programs have been used to increase the number of wild fish. So, so before you go on, Dave, uh, give the, the viewers here a little, um, just give them a little insight on what the, the broodstock program is, because it's something that we haven't really caught on to down here. And I don't know why, because it seems to make so much sense. Yeah, it actually got started in British Columbia. It's my understanding. It's too bad Jack's not on because he's really the guy when it comes to broodstock programs and all the, the details and information there. But basically what it is, is we are in many of the programs in Oregon, anglers are actually capturing wild steelhead, wild salmon, and then they're being used as parents for the hatchery offspring. Mm. So those fish, other than the time, the short period of time that they spend in the hatchery, basically are the same fish that are coming out of the gravel in the river. Yeah, they're just getting um, a little boost. Right. They're getting a head start. Um, and that can be a good thing and a bad thing. There are some studies out there that show um, that, that that does have an impact on the genetics, um, but it's minuscule. Mm -hmm. And over time, those changes can be reversed. Okay, yeah, because I'd heard some people were anti broodstock, and I'm thinking I can't I can't wrap my head around what uh, what the downside is. But it sounds like that's the, the genetic thing a little bit, huh? Well, you, you know, steelhead in particular, salmon as well, are are a remarkable being. So Mother Nature designed them so that they adjust to whatever environment that they're in very quickly. Right. And we all know that salmon and steelhead tend to stray a lot. So mm -hmm. they may be born in one river, but they actually wind up spawning in another river. That's Mother Nature's way of making sure that there's a constant supply of fish uh, for all the rivers. Sure. And in the genetics adjust based on their environment. That's the way Mother Nature designed them. That's the way God built them. So when you put them into a hatchery environment, which is much different than the natural environment that, that, they're, that they are uh, programmed and designed to live in, it is going to have an impact on their genetics. And that's what people get all wound up about. We're changing the genetics of these fish and they predict that over an extended period of time, that's going to have some negative consequence on those wild fish runs. But what we're seeing is no negative consequence, right? So we all bought into this. We need to stop um, planting so many hatchery fish right. 20, 25 years ago. Yep. And in Oregon, Washington, California. Likely much the same in California. Yep. We've seen significant reductions in the number of hatchery fish that are being planted. And, and the and, promise was that we'd see this rebound in wild fish. Oregon, we haven't seen that. Washington, haven't they haven't seen that. Nope. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, California, you haven't seen that. Well, that tells you a number of things. And the most prominent is... Hatchery fish aren't causing the decline of the wild fish because right. if you took them away or significantly reduced their numbers, you should see a rebound in the wild fish. And that's simply not happening. Right. 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 And it's, I mean, it's uncanny how you can trace the uh, our Chinook runs down here on the Sacramento system to that time when they stopped. Uh, you know, in early 2000s, like 2002 was our big year on the Sacramento system. And we had close to 800,000 fall Chinook come up. And um, and then it was panic time because, oh, no, we have too many, too many, which that's a hard concept for me to get behind. Oh, they're right. superimposing on each other and all that. There's not a habitat, which there isn't as much because we have all these big canyon dams. I agree with that. But if you've ever been to Alaska, and I'm sure you have. Um, I just wonder if some of these people making these decisions actually have not been because you go and you look at five different species of salmon spawning in the same river on top of each other. And so, I mean, go, go, go to a pink salmon river and tell me that uh, 
that uh, superimposition uh, where they're you know spawning on top of each other is is detrimental when you can literally walk across the the river on salmonbacks without getting your feet wet. So um, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's we don't have back in those days we had tons of fish spawning in the riffles and now there's hardly any and uh, I think that exactly illustrates what you're saying. So um, so what what's the solution? What what do we do here? Well. We're starting at the very basics, at the beginning. We need to change the narrative. So there is a generation, two generations of anglers out there, of decision makers out there that have constantly heard that hatcheries are bad. Right. And one of the things that we need to do to recover wild fish is to reduce or eliminate hatchery production. Well, history is showing us very quickly over 20, 25 years that that's simply not the case. So the first thing we need to do is change that narrative. Hatcheries are not bad. Hatcheries are not the enemy. Hatcheries are not the reason that our wild fish are in decline. Right. Hatcheries are actually an important tool to recovering wild salmon and steelhead. There are numerous examples throughout the Pacific Northwest, likely in California as well, where runs didn't exist, but now do because of hatchery programs. You know, you, you look at hatchery production, you look at the runs that we fish on, over 75% of the salmon and steel had harvested in the state of Oregon come from hatcheries. 75% of the salmon caught in the Puget Sound come from hatcheries. 90% of the harvested steelhead in Washington come from hatcheries. Mm. I'm going to rely on you to tell me what the percentage of hatchery fish are in the ocean off of California. I think that's a challenge. You guys don't clip 100% of your fish like we do that's in right. That's right. That's Oregon right. and Washington. But here's a number that will likely shock you. 90 90%. 90% of the salmon and steelhead swimming in the Columbia River come from hatcheries. Wow. Yeah. Without hatcheries, we, we have no nothing. fishery. We got nothing. And, and we're seeing that happening. You know, it's just, it's like death by a thousand cuts. It just, everything's trending, trending downward. And I wonder when um, or if at some point don't humans matter? I mean, the, the fact that, we like to fish. We, we, uh, you know, some people make a living off of fish. It's a, uh, a recreational thing that's healthy for people. It's protein. Um, it's, you know, I, I'm all for restoring wild runs where it makes sense. And I think, I, I don't think at all your organization is anti wild fish, right? No. Yeah. No, yeah. absolutely not. It, and that's, that's number one at the top of our list. We need to continue to do everything we can to protect and restore our wild fish. I've been in this game for over 40 years. I've spent my entire adult life, as has Jack and the other directors of Hatchery Wild Coexist, doing everything we can to protect and restore our wild fish. This is not an anti-wild fish campaign by any means. But at the same time, we recognize, we understand that without hatcheries, we don't have fisheries. Right. And there, you know, our forefathers bought into this decades ago. They made decisions that we're still dealing with today. And we simply can't go back and make all of those corrections. Right. You know, there are a dozen high head dams on the Willamette River. And when they built those dams, the decision was not a big deal. We know we're going to lose natural production but we're going to replace that with hatchery production. Mm -hmm. That was a deal that was made before you and I had any say in this thing. Right, right. And we simply can't go back and change that. And man's impact on the environment continues to be the biggest issue these wild fish face. There are more of us. We demand more land. We demand more water. Yeah. We're having a greater impact our footprint is growing on the environment. Without hatcheries, we're not going to have fish. So we need to do hatcheries the best way we can do them. 
And that's what this campaign is all about, recognizing the importance of hatcheries, making sure that anglers, decision makers, the folks that are making those decisions about how much money is going to go into hatchery production, understand how important these hatcheries are. And you laid it out. You know, a lot of businesses, tourism, you know, if you look in Oregon and Washington, likely much the same in California, mom and pop grocery stores, mm. you know, this whole Corona thing has really changed the dynamic when it comes to the tourist industry. Who sure. knows how that's going to play out? Right. But I tell you what, I was fishing on the Willamette River today in downtown Portland, something I've been doing for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And there were more boats out there today than there were at the same time last year. Wow. So when there's, when you can't do the other things that we all would mm -hmm. like to be doing, mm -hmm. fishing is an important fallback. Like you said, being outdoors, enjoying fresh air, having the opportunity to catch a salmon in downtown Portland. How cool is that? It's so cool. So cool. And, and, and to further that, you think about, um, you know, kids right now, if, if you had opportunity uh great fishing opportunities you're gonna save a few kids along the way too right the ones that go if there wasn't you know like we we don't have a ton of great fishing anymore so some kid who might have been into springer fishing in downtown portland out of his little valco ends up you know going down the wrong path and getting into you know who knows what meth and and so it seems like there's just so many benefits to uh to having healthy fisheries now um Let's take a break here for just a sec. We're getting some comments. You want to want to answer some questions, Dave? I'll I'll do my best. Okay, let's okay. let's see what we got going here. Oh, we got a bunch of them here. Let's uh, scroll up. Uh, so uh, let's see. James Kramer is a steelhead an enemy of a salmon because they steal their eggs. They're... No, James. Uh, they everybody thinks that steelhead follow salmon up river just to eat the eggs, but typically steelhead are uh, going up river to spawn. So. Um, if you are a gravid female and a, uh, a, you know, hopped up hormone buck and there's a steelhead stealing your eggs, yeah, you're not too thrilled with them, but it's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, that big a deal as far as natural enemies. Uh, let's see, uh, Thomas Vasconi, what's up long time? That must be somebody, you know, huh? Or, or maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, 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 I forgot, Tom. <laughs> I, you know, getting old sucks. No, uh, Thomas Vasconi. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Don't they use hatchery fish for the Great Lakes? Absolutely they do. And they, they have some, I think, some successful natural spawning going on there. But it's, I mean, without hatcheries, obviously those things would have never been there <laughs> in the first place. And you ask anybody on the tribs of Lake Michigan or any of those places and they don't care if it's a hatchery fish or not. And that, that leads me to a question. Um, so one of the things that people talk about is fitness levels of, um, of hatchery fish are inferior to, to wild fish. And I'm thinking, okay, you have a, a say just a, a Chinook smolt that they release out of a hatchery, he swims down, especially in our system where they got to go through all this hot water and stripers and squawfish and everything else, get through the delta, get out to the ocean, spend three or four years out there, make it all the way back through the sea lions and the great whites and the killer whales and everything, all the trollers and, and me and everybody else. They get back and they spawn either in the hatchery or they pull up short in the riffle. I'm, explain to me how that fish is inferior. To me, it seems like he's exhibiting... All the traits we want. He's a survivor. He's one out of, uh, you know, whatever it is, one out of 6,000 or <laughs> whatever the odds are that made it. And how is he inferior? So tell me that, tell Dave. Me that, Dave. I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that is, in fact, an argument that we hear a lot, that hatchery fish are inferior. They're less fit. You mentioned earlier about those hatchery fish spawning and the degree of success that they have. Well, the truth is a hatchery fish doesn't even have an opportunity to spawn if there are wild fish there. Really? So if the spawning area is fully seeded with wild fish, then hatchery fish, all they become is abundance, right? Mm. So if there are not enough wild fish there to fully seed the available area, 
then the hatchery fish can give it a shot. And some have a great deal of success. Others don't. Sure. I can't explain that. Yeah. But this whole less fit argument, and I agree with you 100%. If they can go out and spend three, four, five years in the natural environment, and they're able to deal with all those obstacles, come back and be prepared to do their thing, I say let them do their thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird to me. And and don't they, on that same vein, don't they uh, uh, occupy the same biological function, basically, or provide the same biological function as a wild fish? So, Again, a little hatchery smolt and a wild smolt are going down river. A kingfisher eats the <laughs> eats them. A uh, you know a trout, a cutthroat eats them. Um, they uh, eat bugs. They get out to sea. They they provide food for marine mammals, humans. And if they make it back, a hatchery fish and a wild fish both die. Provide nutrients. So I'm I'm still missing the boat here on and why that's a bad thing. I mean. Uh, don't we don't we rather have fish missing adipose fins than none at all? I mean, I, that's I don't know. Yeah, I, I think part of this goes back again to those past hatchery practices when yeah. they were using out of basin stocks. Right. You know, one of one of the biggest uh, hatcheries in, in the Northwest was on the Columbia River, and back you know 70, 80 years ago, again. It, the hatchery managers looked at raising fish the same way that they looked at raising cattle. So if you wanted to change the way your cow looked, whether you wanted it bigger or you wanted to change the color or whatever, then you brought in parentage to add those traits to your stock. So these guys were bringing fish down from Alaska <laughs> and putting them into the mix in, in uh, Oregon. They were taking fish from the Willamette Valley, taking them to the coast, taking fish from the coast and bringing them into the valley. So a lot of mistakes were made and those traits weren't necessarily good for those fish. So when, when you're doing that sort of thing, I can see how that would reduce the fitness. You know, I, I saw one example and this may be totally Greek uh, to your folks in California, but in Oregon, they used to take winter steelhead that were from the lower Columbia River. Mm -hmm. their, their streams of origin were, say, 30, 40 miles up the Columbia River. And they were being planted some 200 miles up the river. Mm -hmm. So when we would catch those fish in December and January, they had already lost their row and their milk. And we always thought, how in the world are we seeing these downstream fish when the run is just getting started? Well, what was happening was those fish are programmed to be ready to spawn 30 miles up the river. Mm -hmm. But because they were being planted some 200 miles up the river, uh, that's where they went. Yep. So those fish didn't match. Those fish had actually dropped their milk and their row 30 miles up the river they kept going those 200 miles so those are the kinds of mistakes that were made years ago because we didn't know now we know we can make those corrections and provide a much better fit fish again one of the things that we advocate for changing our hatchery practices changing our management so that the fish that we're producing from our hatcheries are the best fit fish for that environment that we can make. Better fish, better returns. Fruit stock programs have a five to seven time higher return rate wow. than non brood stock hatchery programs. We know how to do it better. That's what we need to do. Well, here in California, uh, we have so many hazards that these things go through that we typically get under 1%, like a quarter of a percent return on Chinook. And so back in the day, we were, it was just a fish factory. We were pumping them out as, as, as many as we can. And then we, like we were talking 20 years ago, we start cutting all that back. Um, and now we don't have any fish. It's, it's like, 
Well, you, you can't have it both ways. Either you're going to have to keep dumping because of the hazards, a bunch of fish or reform how you're doing it, like you say, and, and, and make better fish. And it seems like there's so many things you can do at a hatchery. And, and I'm sure you've heard about the McCullamy River hatchery down here. That's been just kind of doing amazing things. They went, the guys who took that hatchery over um, and it's a, it's a state hatchery, but it's funded at least in part by a util, uh, utility uh, district. So they, they have a kind of an easier time getting money than, than just the straight state hatcheries do. Um, and, and the East Bay mud is the, um, the group that owns the dam above them and, and pays the, the money for the hatchery. And so they're, they're very proactive, um, getting, getting stuff done at the hatchery, but we went and took a tour down there to see what they're doing. Cause these guys took over the hatchery and it, the McCombie was getting, like 200 uh, Chinook back a year. Now they're getting closer to 20,000. And, uh, and it's a tiny little river and it's, it's outshining, um, you know, every, every system or every river in the system nowadays. And what they're doing, none of it's rocket science at all. Um, they, they, first of all, they care deeply. The guys down there really just have, you know, it's a passion for them. So you can tell just the way they talk about the place, the fish are their babies. And so, just that right there makes you go the extra mile, but just little things like it was interesting. We went to, uh, uh, it was in the winter time. So the, the Chinook were little, you know, egg sacks still attached guys. And they were inside in the facility in these, how uh, they kind of, you know, riceways that were like a half pipe about that, that wide. And, you know, as long as the building and they were segregated into groups and I don't know if it was just numbers or age class. Now they're all the same age, but, some reason they were all separated and there was a little wire screen in between the, the sections of fish. And uh, the guy said, you know, what we try to do here is just improve, you know, try to make a one to 2% improvement here and a one to 2% improvement here and, you know, start adding it up. And it's a, it's a big improvement. And so with that thing, it was, he said that the state issued screens were just big enough that that little egg sack would get, stuck in the screen and then they have somebody have to go and scrape all the dead salmon off it every day he's like well why don't we just make screens uh that have smaller mesh oh you know it's like and it was stuff like that all the way through that that i mean it was just it was common sense and that's kind of the scary thing that common sense was so novel to me that going to this hatchery like oh these guys actually use their their noggins a little bit and there's there's great people in all the hatcheries don't get me wrong but this one's just they're just taking it to the next level, and and it shows that if you do reform uh, hatcheries and get them get them going the right way, you can really make a difference. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're producing better fish, you don't necessarily have to produce a whole lot more of them. If they're a, a more fit, quality fish, uh, then you don't have to release eighty gazillion of them. Is that is that somewhat accurate? You're exactly right. And that's what we're seeing with the successful rootstock programs on the North Oregon coast. You know, they're reducing a third of the number of fish that they used to release, but we're actually seeing higher returns of fish coming back. So again, the fish are just more fit. You know, you're talking about hatchery practices and things we can do from a common sense standpoint. Let me give you a, a quick example. So in, I believe it was in Eastern Washington, a hatchery that's funded by a public utility district had a challenge when it came to water. They didn't have adequate water to run the longitudinal ponds mm -hmm. that we're used to seeing. Everybody's been to the hatcheries and have yeah. seen these long rectangular ponds that the fish right. are in. And they've noticed that most of the fish are at one end or the other. There aren't very many fish in the long straightaways, right? They're either yeah. one end or the other. Okay. Well, because they didn't have enough water, they decided to use circular ponds. Mm -hmm. They could do that, have the same amount of fish in there, but using less water. Well, what they realized over time was they were seeing a higher percentage of returns from the fish that were being raised in these circular ponds. Interesting. So if you stop and think about it, those fish that are in the long, long, the long ponds, they're lazy, right? Mm -hmm. right? All fish, all beings are lazy. So they're going to the areas where there's the least amount of flow, least amount of current. Mm -hmm. In a circular tank, circular pond, 
there's no getting out of the current. You yeah. got to keep yeah. swimming, right? <laughs> so these fish are actually more fit from the standpoint that they are better conditioned when they're released and that results in a higher return. So that wasn't why they instituted the circular ponds, sure. but that's one of the benefits. And so why wouldn't we implement that sort of change in all of our hatcheries? Right. 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 You need less water. It actually uh, helps when it comes to feeding the fish. It helps when it comes to medicating the fish, if that's uh, necessary. And you're reducing a better fish that results in higher returns. And it's it's so simple, right? And, and right. one of the things one here things that here. Uh, a um, PhD biologist told me that we could do to help our Chinook and Steelhead in our hatcheries in California, because we, of course, have a striped bass as a, a predator and and largemouth bass and spotted bass and pike minnow and, you know, just all kinds of things that uh, are in their way. And he said, what we do in our long rectangular ponds, like you're talking about, is, you know, they have the little automated feeders and they feed them the pellet food. Well, they feed them on the surface. And I'd never thought about this, but it makes so much sense. He says, why do we feed them on the surface? Because we're training these fish to come up and be up on the top where, you know, wild Wild fish are down, hugging the bottom, you know, not sitting up la la land up on the surface. And so he said, well, you, you got to, you know, the feed is what it is. So because I asked him, well, how do you, you can't, are you going to make sinking food or something? He said, no, what you do is you feed them at night. And uh, I thought, oh, that's smart because we're feeding them in the middle of the day, training them to go to the surface in broad daylight, which isn't uh, conducive to survival. And I said, well, okay, you got to hire some guy to work the, you know, the graveyard shift. He goes, no, they're on automated timers. I mean, it's a matter of just turning a knob to feed them at night, yet we don't do it. And I, I just, those kind of things make me crazy. If we could, again, if we could produce or could increase survival by a couple percent, just doing that without, it doesn't cost anything. And and yet we don't seem to do it. And it's, it's frustrating. Another thing that I always thought would be cool, and I saw it at the McCullumy Hatchery is, making raceways that look like rivers. And I know they're hard to clean because you have gravel and stuff. They actually, in the McCullumy Hatchery, have steelhead spawning in their little raceways in the gravel, which is pretty cool. And so I thought, you know, this might be too labor intensive. But another thing I was thinking about is you have, the again, the long raceways. There's no no training for bird attacks from above, right? So it's almost like you need to hire some kid with a big, uh, I don't know, stuffed bird or something and have them slap it on the water you know, going up and down the the raceways just to get fish to, you know, learn to duck and maybe put some logs or something to train them to, I don't know, it, it's such a sterile environment the way it is now. It seems like there's a lot of tweaks you could do that would be pretty easy and much better for the fish. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, so this is, this is the kinds of things, this is the information that people need to hear, people need to understand that hatcheries aren't bad. So um, there are a lot of studies out there, scientific studies out there that show the negative effects of hatchery fish on wild fish. But there are also studies out there that show that there is either no effect or there can actually be a positive effect. And that's the kind of information that we are trying to highlight, at mm -hmm. least level the playing field. People need to see the studies that say hatcheries can cause problems, but they also need to see the studies that show that hatcheries can solve problems. That hatcheries can be good for wild fish. Hatcheries can make a positive difference. And that's really what this campaign is all about, getting the information out there so people understand both sides of the story. You know, stories are like pancakes, there's two sides. And for the last 20 years, only the negative uh, stories about hatcheries have been getting out there. And now it's time to highlight the positive aspects of our hatcheries. And Before that's what we're trying to do. Well, that's that's awesome. great. Um, great mission. Let's go to a few more questions here. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. So this is a good one uh, from Riles. This is, uh, why don't hatchery, all hatcheries follow the same protocols? And that's... Uh, I think that probably, and you might know better than I, Dave, but that uh, I'm sure gets into uh, gets into some politics <laughs> there. 
Um, cause you guys are doing Bruce talk. We're not and and you know, on and on and on. So, um, it's, it's, I think a little political there, isn't it? Well, yeah. And those, those protocols, those management practices are always evolving. You know, if you look at the hatchery management plan in Washington, it's under big review right now. And, uh, we expect a lot of changes there, some good, probably some changes that aren't good when it comes to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, Oregon has had their hatchery management plan in place uh, for a large number of years. Um, but you don't just flip a switch and change the game. It takes time to implement all of these different processes. You're, you're talking about um, – a species here that their life cycle is four five, six years long, right? So it takes a while to make these changes and get them fully implemented. Um, again, I apologize. I'm not expert when it comes to California. I'm learning a lot about mm -hmm. California through this process. Um, and we know that uh, your challenges are just as great in some instances greater than what we're dealing with in uh, Oregon and Washington. Absolutely. Okay. Let's, uh, here's a familiar name. Mr. Cadino are all are our most, I think is what he meant to say. Hatcheries today set up to handle broodstock programs. Well, I can tell you we're not down here, Dave, how about up North? I think, uh, on the, on the coast, uh, the North Oregon coast and moving down, it, it's moving from North to South in Oregon mm -hmm. on, uh, when it comes to steelhead broodstock programs. Uh, clearly, they've been successful. Uh, so there's growing support uh, within um, the policymakers, the managers, when it comes to broodstock programs. Um, many of them rely on volunteers uh, to actually capture those fish. Yep. Um, and we've seen some, some glitches you know, it takes a while to get that figured out and, and get to doing it right. Um, sure. So where the parents come from and how they're incorporated into the actual broodstock and the hatcheries, um, you know, I don't think there's a lot of changes that need to be made. So um, I think the question had to do with are the hatcheries prepared? Um, I think it's it's more in just changing um policies and practices, I think in most cases, they have the facilities that they need, at least in Oregon. I don't know about Washington um, or California. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a slow grind, but it sounds like we're, at least you guys are, are sort of moving in the right direction in that. Uh, let's see, we have, whoops, we already did that one. Uh, Michael Homer says, create a rating system and rate hatcheries. Uh, that would be cool. You start, you get into government and things get a little, little funky there. Um, but, uh, you know, why not? Well, I, I think identifying best practices for hatcheries is definitely uh, something that needs to be done. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Here we go. Ryan Annie says, uh, Broodstock is just starting up here in Washington. Oregon is set the standard. Thank you, Oregon. All right. There you go. So uh, the times may be a change, and that's that's good to good to hear. Uh, what else we got here? James Kramer, have you been catching a lot of wild chinook or hatchery chinook on the Sacramento River? Well, James, that's a it's a tough question to answer because um, the fish uh, in California we only uh, fin clip the adipose fin on twenty five percent of our chinook, so. A lot of the fish we catch are likely hatchery fish, but they still have the adipose fins. So um, hard to say. I mean, we do catch a lot of clipped ones. And so just based on that, I assume we're catching a whole heck of a lot of hatchery fish that just aren't aren't clipped. Um, okay, what else we got here? Da, 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 da. Uh, and feel free, folks, if you got any questions um, for Dave or myself, uh, throw them up here. Let's see. Killer B says, uh, uh, <laughs> there we are without him. And that's the kind of point of Dave's organization here. And uh, 
there's, there's just there's no no real future without them. I'm afraid. I mean, you know, places like Alaska, and BC still have wild fish, but uh, down here where humans have have encroached so heavily on the habitat and and just the fish themselves, uh, it's just it's a fact of life that, that we just need to keep them going. And um, so that's that's where it sounds like uh, Hatchery Wild Coexist is uh, coming in. And so, what are you guys doing? You guys are spreading the word through uh, social media and uh, the website. And how else are you getting the word out, Dave? You know, before this whole Corona thing showed up, uh, yeah. I think I was scheduled for, I think I had 10 presentations scheduled over a three month period. Oh, it's still uh, had clubs still and that kind of stuff. You bet. Any, anybody that will slow down long enough for us to have a conversation with them, we're we're ready and prepared to do that, and and that's really what we need everybody to do, right? Become informed, understand the issues, and then talk to anybody that will listen, whether yeah. it's your fishing buddies, uh, uh, relatives, uh, church group, anybody that'll slow down long enough for you to let them know that hatcheries are important. We need to do everything we can to ensure their funding. And make sure that we're doing the best we can when it comes to our hatchery practices. Um, you know, it, it's up, up to each and every one of us that enjoy sport fishing. And when you stop and look at the numbers, we, we think because we hang with people that tend to think and do the same kind of things that right. we do. We think the whole world thinks yeah. fishing is important. Right. But when you stop and look at the numbers in Oregon and Washington, only about six to seven percent of the population fishes. Yep. The other ninety-three percent doesn't care about fishing. Doesn't give they don't a care about hatcheries. They don't care about how good the run is. Right. But we all think everybody thinks like us, right? And <laughs> fishing's the most important thing in the world. Well, we got a huge uphill battle when it comes to ensuring that our hatcheries are properly funded. You know, and our decision makers are trying to decide between spending money on roads, education, housing, hatcheries, when, only, when less than 10% of the yeah. population yeah. thinks hatcheries are important. Right. It's a challenge. Especially for people that live in a big city. I mean, you, you got a kind of a rare breed, uh, bird there with uh, Portland right on the river, but um I would use down here, uh, Los Angeles, for example, you know, if you live in LA and are you going to care whether or not there's a salmon hatcheries on the Sacramento river? Probably not. I mean, you know, uh, it's just out of sight, out of mind. And you, you know, that salmon, uh, you know, tastes good at the restaurant, but that's about it. So you're, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, we got some more questions here. We, uh, okay. All kinds of good ones here. Um, is it possible to live spawn the native stocks to create these brood stock problem uh, programs? If so, what is the survival right uh, rate of a live spawn steelhead? I, you know, hopefully Dave, you know that because yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. So all the brood stock programs that we have in Oregon on on the Oregon coast, all those fish are live spawned and mm -hmm. are returned to the river. Oh, cool! And cool. they now have examples of those fish coming back multiple times. So wow. they wow. they uh, tag them so they can be identified. Mm -hmm. And th so it's been shown that those fish can go back to the ocean, spend another year and come back and spawn again. So yeah, every single one of the broodstock programs that I'm familiar with all live spawn their fish. Excellent. Are they doing any, um, I, I know there's something, some in the Northwest and maybe even here um, I've read about, and I can't remember where now, but uh, have you seen any of that rehabbing of the downers stuff that uh, some facilities are doing where they, the spawned out fish, put them in a tank and kind of help them up and, you know, get them healthy and send them on their way. Yeah, I'm not really dialed in, but but I I read an article about that. Um, and that's kind of a cool concept as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. Uh, what else we got? Why is it only 25% of the fish are clipped on the sack? Rug River Hatcheries is claiming 20% on the coho, but we can only keep clipped. They aren't going to clip them. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's there's been a lot of folks here in California, Brian, and I know you uh, I know you used to be here. I don't know if you're you're still here anymore, but um, um, that 
is a question for the ages. It's it's been a battle. Um, one of the things that is um, sort of the response from the state is it's too expensive, and and we do produce a gazillion fish, but so do the uh, Columbia River hatcheries. Obviously, if ninety percent of the fish coming back are so, I don't I don't I think that's kind of an easy out answer. Um, uh, it's I, you know, I don't know. I don't know why we're not doing it. Uh, I know there's been some uh, pushes to uh, to get that shifted. And I think it, it seems to make sense. It's a, it's a strong management tool. And you could seems like you could make the regulations a lot easier, too. If, uh, you know, whatever the number is, you can keep two of anything with a with an adipose fin clip. And um, so, um, yeah, there's probably some political uh, stuff. I mean, <laughs> Kenny Priest. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's kind of what we're getting at, Kenny, right there. Um, um, yeah, I I don't know. <laughs> okay, Julie Jewel, what happens to the hatchery fish after they spawn on the sack? Oh boy. Well, our guides association, NorCal Guides and Sportsman Association, just put out a video this last. Uh, I guess it was earlier this winter, it was right before COVID, actually. I think, and uh, we went around and uh, checked out the hatcheries on the sack. The American and the feather, and um, we found out that there's an awful lot of hatchery fish being killed um, without being spawned. And you, you said spawned, but uh, without being spawned, they let them into the hatchery. They don't shut the gate; they just let them in. They bonk them, and they get sent off to a uh, place in Washington State to be sold. And if you want to read into that and, and, and get more info onto that, check out on YouTube. The video is called Unspawn. And it's about an hour long. And uh, it's it's pretty eye-opening to see what we're doing with all these fish that are not being spawned, that we paid to raise. Oh, look at that. Wow, boom. Unspawned. <laughs> but uh, that we, we're uh, being paid or we're paying to raise, and yet uh, we don't get to uh, harvest them. We just watch them go away in totes on trucks. So I don't know if you caught that, Dave. If you haven't, you should check it out because it's pretty eye-opening. And yeah, I, it's going on up up your way too, I believe. Yeah, great video. Uh, enjoyed it very much. We've actually shared the link on our Facebook page. Oh, great. I don't know if yeah. we shared it on Instagram or not, but uh, yeah, good piece of work there. Very well done. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that was, it was pretty, uh, pretty eye-opening. Um, and, and frustrating too, as you can imagine. So, um, so what's, uh, what's next with, uh, Hatchery Wild Coexist? Um, what, what, what do you, uh, what's next on the dock? I know COVID's got you, your speaking tour is, uh, reduced and, and uh, by the way, I heard, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Mike Codino. Um, somebody said during the Portland sportsman's show this winter before all this kicked in. He said, holy smokes, these guys are rock stars. They got a booth going right now. It's the most popular spot uh, in the show. So that that's cool. Sounds like uh, the word's getting out. Yeah. So the response, as you might imagine, has been uh, overwhelming. Uh, it really kind of caught us by surprise, actually, as to how much support there has been. So I don't know how many of your viewers out there are familiar with Patagonia and what they've been doing when it comes to this anti-hatchery narrative. Artificial. They're spending, they're spending big money. They're spending yep. millions of dollars yep. to close our hatcheries. Yep. Uh, they just produced a video that vilifies hatcheries and draws the conclusion that, that hatcheries are driving our wild fish to extinction. Right. And they're showing that movie all over the United States. They're, yep. they're showing it in Europe. Um, they're spending big bucks to close down our hatcheries. We don't have millions of dollars, right. but we've got lots of people that are avid anglers. So one of the things we're doing with the campaign is putting together the largest coalition of supporters that we can. So if you go to our website, you'll see all of the companies all of the organizations that have stepped up in support of this campaign. So we can't fight them with dollars, but we can fight them with voices. Sure. And that's what this is all about. So we'd love people to go to our website, 
hatchery-wild-coexist.com and sign up, subscribe, join the fight. So here's the deal. Likely all of you are, are a member of one or maybe even two sport fishing organizations. You're right. paying 25, 35 bucks a year for your membership. Hatchery Wild Coexist will give you a life membership for free. Wow. Beat that wow. deal. <laughs> All you need to do is go to our website and subscribe. So it's all about developing the loudest, biggest, most diverse voice that we can when it comes to defending our hatcheries. You got to help us out. We're all in this thing together. You probably heard that way too much because that's been used so much when it comes to this COVID thing. But really, it comes down to each and every one of us doing our part right. to protect this sport that we love so much and the fish that we love so much. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the, the tough the, thing. The um, thing. Uh, we anglers are often sort of... Um, you know, it's hard to get people uh, sort of apathetic, hard to get people moving sometimes. And it's like, yeah, I love salmon, I, uh, but uh, join an organization or, you know, well, yeah, it's just it's weird. And, and we're all guilty of it. Um, it it's, but if we could just unite everyone and that's what our guides association has done. Uh, we've we've pulled the commercial salmon guys and the sport guys and, and just getting everybody together saying, Hey, we, we all want the same thing. I mean, we have some differences here and there, you know, there's little things we can smooth out, but uh, overall we all want the same thing. And if we don't unite while we're bickering and that's been the thing, these, the, the people that want these fish to go away uh, down here, a lot of it has to do with, you know, water usage and, and sucking water out of the river. And they want to pit us to, uh, against each other and, and have us arguing amongst ourselves. And in the meantime, while we're, you know, you fly fish, so you suck. Well, you bass fish, well, you suck. You know, and while we're all arguing, you see the uh, water guy sneaking out the back door with the big, uh, you know, the big contract for the water. So just laughing all the way home. And so uh, it sounds like uh, your group and our group are, are starting to unite the troops and, and, you're right. Absolutely right. There's nothing that we can, uh, you know, we can't count out, uh, spend them. So we're going to have to, um, out, uh, out voice them. And so that's, uh, what uh, people need to do is go to the, uh, the website here and sign up. It's free people. Come on, just get your voice on there. And I know, uh, I've seen ads in the magazines and, and on uh, Instagram and stuff, uh, where, any fishing organization, it doesn't have to be fishing, but anybody who joins your campaign, you throw their logo up and say, you know, so-and-so, uh, Yakima Bait or whoever it is, is, you know, joined, uh, joined the fight. And so um, that's pretty cool. It gives people a little, you know, a little shot in the arm for helping out. And uh, so what else can people do? Well, you can buy swag. Ah. So we're, we're a hundred percent volunteer organization, right? Sure. We all work for free, do everything we do for free. Uh, we've got the opportunity for folks to donate, and all of that money goes directly into the campaign. So it's uh, buying advertising. Uh, we've got additional studies that we want to do. We, we know that science can be on our side if we can just get good objective science. Right. Uh, economics is a big deal. You mentioned that earlier. Um, the economics are on our side. So we're in the process of having an economic evaluation done on the importance of hatcheries uh, in Oregon and Washington. So all the donations, all the money that's generated from the sale of hats and stickers and sweatshirts and all that stuff, all that money is going directly back into this campaign. You mentioned the advertising in the magazines, uh, not cheap, although we uh, we tend to get a really good deal. I would hope those guys, so. but still there's an expense associated with all of that. So, yeah. um, you know, five bucks is five bucks and you, you get 5,000 people and they all donate five bucks. That's going to make a huge difference. So support us in any way you, you can. Uh, but the most important thing is share the narrative hatcheries are not the enemy hatcheries are not the problem done right hatcheries can help us solve the problem 
when it comes to our wild fish numbers. Amen. Preach it, Dave. <laughs> so uh, let's see what else. We got another question here real quick. So do you guys work uh, in California at all? Sounds like not. Uh, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. Any chance of a PA chapter? All right, good one. Well, we'll certainly do everything we can support every effort um, in California. So again, the information when it comes to the scientific studies, the research that's been done that supports the benefits of hatcheries. So if you, JD, or members of your organization are making presentations to the legislature or other decision makers, we'll certainly do everything we can to provide the data that you need to make a good, solid argument in favor of our hatcheries. Um, so, so we don't have a Washington chapter and an Oregon chapter and a California chapter. We're just trying to provide the information that helps people spread mm -hmm. the word that hatcheries are not a not problem. problem. Right. They are actually our savior <laughs> when it comes to our fisheries. And yep. so that information works all everywhere. It's not just good in Oregon or good in Washington. It's good in California as well. Well, one of the things that uh, is brought up a lot is the, you know, the, you, know, you have these uh, hatchery genetic management plans and all this stuff going on. Um, we've been talking about trying to figure out a study, uh, get a study done on our hatchery fish, because there's people that'll swear up and down hatchery fish and wild fish are different genetically. And I, 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 you know, I'm not a geneticist, obviously, but uh, um, it seems to me that they're they're pretty much the same fish, right? So, Whoops. So, so, so the genes, geneticists can demonstrate that the genetics of a hatchery fish and a wild fish are different. And we talked about that just a little bit. That's because of the way these fish are wired to adapt to whatever environment that they're subjected to. But what you have to ask is, so what's the consequence of that? Okay, so you take two wild parents, you take their offspring, and they spend a short period of time in a concrete pond, and that changes their genetics. And that's their argument. Their genetics have been changed. But what's the consequence of that? How hmm. does that play out over time? Does hmm. it have a significant consequence when it comes to the abundance of those fish, the studies I've seen say no. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, I suspect that they, they don't know necessarily that that's the case. Interesting. Interesting. Well, this is all uh, super, super fascinating, Dave. I sure appreciate you coming on. And uh, I, I noticed uh, uh, Mr. Stone, James Stone, uh, you know, I'm the vice president of the Guys Association. He's El Presidente. Um we need to, uh, and I know you you know James a little bit. Um, we need to kind of, uh, we're fighting sort of the same fight here. So I think uh, strength in numbers, we'll have to see how we can scratch each other's backs a little bit on this and, uh, you know, move the move the fight forward and to the people. So there you go. Um, but, on. Well, we're here to help and do everything we can to support you guys down there. Like you say, you know, What's good for all? What's good for one is good for all. Absolutely. So just reach out. All right. Well, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get uh, Jack uh, on board because, uh, like you say, he's a an encyclopedia of all this stuff. But uh, it's great having you on, and uh, let's do it again, and let's uh, let's stay in touch because um, uh, there's definitely more more of this conversation to have. Yeah. Well, thanks, JD. I really appreciate the opportunity. You know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I love reading your articles, and and uh, you are a stand-up stellar guy. So this has really been an honor and a pleasure for me to spend time with you here. And uh, hopefully we can get the word out and do everything we can to ensure that we've got abundant fish for the future. You know, I, I'm doing this for my kids and my grandkids. Absolutely. I think I've probably seen the best fishing I'm ever going to see in my lifetime. Yep. But I sure as heck want to make sure that they have similar opportunities when they're my age. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's hard to imagine. I mean, it's going away so fast, so fast. I've been seeing uh, posts from Bill Herzog on Instagram throwing up, uh, and Buzz Ramsey too, throwing up, 
Now, I remember catching fish on the toodle or, you know, whatever, the hoe, you know, back. It was on, was only that 20 years ago and it used to be full of fish and now it's nothing. And and uh, I, I feel like uh, I almost have like black and white memories like of the old days now, you know, it's just pretty sad. Like, And then you think about uh, my grandfather, you know, he saw a whole like my best fishing was the worst fishing he saw, you know. And so it's just been going do 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 do. So, anyway, well, uh, I'm really stoked that you guys are uh, in the fight. And wait, we hang on. We got one more comment. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Just a, a quick thank you. You bet, Ryan. And uh, make sure you go and join uh, join the organization there. And uh, uh, we will uh, we'll get Dave back on. Hopefully, Jack sometime, and we'll we'll catch up and see what's going on. Until then, Dave. Thanks again so much. Great talking to you. And we'll uh, we'll be in touch soon. Okay. All right, man. Sounds, sounds good. Tight lines. All right. See you later. Wow. That was cool. He's a stand up guy and uh, super knowledgeable. And uh, so definitely uh, go to their website and check that out. And uh, be sure to, yeah, there you go. Subscribe to me on Fish with JD on YouTube. And um, what else? Uh, gosh, next Wednesday, seven o'clock, same bad time, same bad channel. And then, again, if you want to uh, check out that steelhead course that I put out, it's catchmoresteelhead.com, and uh, that'll uh, get you on the way to catching a few more steelies. And, and with that, I think uh, I'm going to go. I got up early today, the last few days. I'm actually working for a little bit here the last couple of days. First time since February. woo -hoo! So uh, I got to get up and go fishing again tomorrow. Uh, I shouldn't say I have to. I am very fortunate to be able to go fishing tomorrow. So uh, anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. It was uh, really informative, and uh, we'll catch you next week.